You know, when, uh, when they contacted me, when the journey contacted me, asked me to speak today, I was very flattered and, and quite honored. Uh, but I didn't know that um, I'd have to follow Bob Stanton, uh, which is not fair at all. That is not fair, Beth. You owe me an awful lot for that. An awful lot. Yes, you have to take good care of me when I come to Waterford next time. And, um, and then, of course, to follow the vodcast is almost an impossible task. Well, that rhymes, vodcast task. That's pretty good. Uh, it's very difficult, in fact, to, to match the kids, and I don't intend to. Um, but, you know, when, when you watch the vodcast, and every year, it doesn't make any difference for me, whether it was in 2009 when we had the good fortune in Harper's Ferry of partnering with our great friends of Journey and creating the first six vodcasts that focused on John Brown and the outbreak of of the Civil War, uh, at least in Harper's Ferry and at least in Virginia and at least in the South. That's where the first shots were fired. And then all the way through today, it doesn't make any difference. When I watch those vodcasts, I feel something. You know, they're not, what we don't remember about those vodcasts, we don't remember dates. Uh, we don't remember even names necessarily that they may present, but we all remember what we feel. And, and you tear up. Because not only are we feeling the emotion of the moment that the kids are presenting, but what we really feel are kids loving history. And that is a dynamic that most people and most kids don't experience in this country. And we know that. And so to see the vodcast grow from the one that we did at Harper's Ferry to now where we have hundreds of kids that have been involved in three states now, and to possibly see it go national through the uh, curriculum guide that you'll develop, and maybe even international, is nothing more than just getting the 21st century interested in the 18th and the 19th and the 20th centuries. Because after all, those are our foundations. And the great words of the Constitution or the 13th and 14th Amendment that, that Mr. Stanton quoted today don't mean a whole lot to a lot of people unless they have some context and some foundation or even more importantly as Bob presented so well to us they have to have feeling yes they were written by intellects and yes they were written to ensure our freedoms but what we really feel when you talk about freedom you don't talk about it you feel it and that's what the vodcasts are that's what the kids do for us and that's the reason why when we walk out of that auditorium all of us feel elated and drained. We feel the great passion of history and the exhaustion of history. And we feel for our future because we know that the past will be in good hands of our future. And so today, when I talk for the next few moments about Harper's Ferry under fire, it's not about, then the book's not about dates. And it's not necessarily even about events. But what I really tried to do in that particular book, and it's different from any of the others that I'd written, was to take the vodcast experience, the feeling of history that the kids have shared with us, and try to have that feeling placed in the words and in the images of that particular book. And I would hope that if any of you uh, are, are willing to take a look at it, that what you walk away with is a whole lot of feeling for history, and especially those people that lived in Harper's Ferry during the war. Now, in all great deference to the Superintendent Tatum, Susan Trail, uh, one incredible day in American history that changed all of us. The Bob, Gettysburg, four days that changed all of us. Three that were ugly, one that was full of hope. Uh, Harper's Ferry, was not so fortunate as to have one day or four days. But unfortunately for Harper's Ferry, it was 1,400 days. 1,400 consecutive days of the American Civil War. You could not escape the war if you lived in Harper's Ferry because you were right on the border between North and South. And the only thing that separated you between two contesting co countries in combat was 900 feet of the Potomac River, and that was not enough to keep you away from a deadly bullet. And so when, when we feel Harper's Ferry during the Civil War, 
the emotion of that place can be felt through a confectioner. We had a great cookie today or a great brownie, or when you walked in this morning and you had an opportunity for some of the breakfast treats, like I know my superintendent enjoyed this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, you know, there's a confectioner in Harper's Ferry who actually is making a very good business out of his confections. He's a very recent immigrant. He's a German. He has seven children. He's actually doing very well there in the town, the new town, the new, the new place of his family, his home. And when the war breaks out, uh, Frederick Roeder, whose home still survives on High Street today in Harpers Ferry, a union man made an interesting decision. He decided that he would remain in Harpers Ferry even though he was surrounded by a foreign country. That the flag that flew over him every day was not the stars and stripes, but the stars and bars. And so Roeder and his family now found themselves threatened daily fearful for their lives, facing a future of uncertainty. The easy thing to do is to move. The courageous thing to do was to remain, which he does. It becomes even more difficult for him economically to sustain himself because the people of Harper's Ferry don't follow his lead and they leave. Most of the people leave. A community of nearly 3,000 people will dwindle to about 100 people because you're on the border between North and South. Most of us would not make the same decision that Mr. Roeder did. We would do like the rest, leave. July 4th, uh, a date that is important that almost anyone could tell you what happened on July 4th uh, in terms of American history. July 4th, 1861, the war is only April, May, June. It's about three months old. And uh, Mr. Roeder, there had been a skirmish that day, the very first firing across the river between Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers. The firing had ceased, and Roeder caught a glimpse of the American flag flying from Maryland, the first time he had seen that flag in months. He apparently decided to take a stroll out to the point where the rivers join to get a closer glimpse of the flag and to feel the pride of being an American in a United States, at least for that moment. As he was walking out there, there was a Union soldier still over on the Maryland Heights watching vigilantly for anything that moved in the town. And he saw something move. And with his rifle, he fired toward the moving object. It wasn't Roeder. He was firing at another person. But his shot was not good. It hit a building, and the bullet ricocheted, and at, just at that moment, Mr. Roeder walked by that building and the bullet landed in his groin. He was badly injured. He crawled about 300 yards back to his home. And there he would expire with his seven children. Now you can't tell that story and not feel something. What about now those orphans? Did he make the right decision? What will their future be in a country that is not their country? And this type of thing gets repeated over and again at Harper's Ferry because the armies don't leave. They don't come in and fight and depart. They come, they stay, they remain. In 1861, towards the latter part of the summer, we now have men from Massachusetts and Connecticut and Pennsylvania that are occupying Harper's Ferry. They see something they've never seen before, African Americans. African Americans coming from the direction of the South, who as they approach the pickets, say to the pickets at Harper's Ferry, we need your help, we need your support. We believe that we will be safe with you. Please let us enter your lines. And they're allowed to pass. And they come behind the Union lines at Harper's Ferry. Some of the first examples of refugees during the American Civil War occurring in the Shenandoah Valley. Oh yeah, the refugees weren't only in the Deep South. They were in the Upper South, and especially in the Valley of Virginia. So Harper's Ferry became a magnet for these refugees. But at that point, 
the Lincoln administration and the United States government wasn't fighting a war about slavery, or at least that wasn't what they said they were doing. And so sure enough, these refugees became a problem. And the government and the Union soldiers, within a few days after their arrival, turned them all back, took them out of the lines, escorted them out of the lines, and escorted them south, back into slavery. How do they feel, these refugees? We don't know what it feels like not to have freedom. But can you imagine? I can't. I, I, so it's really trite to say, can you imagine what it feels like to not have freedom and then to think that you do have freedom and then the people that you think are going to give you freedom take that away from you? That's a Harper's Ferry story that would be repeated time and again. We don't know how many countless African-American refugees came into the lines but weren't permitted to stay. 1862, the war now about a year old, and something very interesting happens at Harpers Ferry. The Union Army now has occupied the town. The railroad is operational. In fact, the railroad brigade holds the town. And the first week of September, uh, raw recruits arrive, and a raw recruit was a new soldier. And they arrive having been in the Army, in some cases, for less than 20 days. And I mean being in the Army for less than 20 days. And suddenly, the opponent, the enemy, shows up, and it's Stonewall Jackson, who was the most feared Confederate in the North in 1862. If you read the newspapers of the period, especially Northern newspapers, like in Chicago or Philadelphia or New York or Harrisburg, you don't see the name Robert E. Lee almost ever, but you do see the name Jackson over and again in northern newspapers. They were fearful of Jackson. And so here are these new men, these new recruits in the Union Army, less than 20 days in the service, there is no boot camp, who suddenly find themselves surrounded by the most feared enemy in the country, Jackson. And they're expected to fight him. It didn't turn out well for them. Jackson will win in September of 1862, ultimately resulting in General Lee making his stand at Sharpsburg. Those men literally became prisoners three weeks into the, their service. Now, you didn't sign up to be a prisoner. You didn't sign up to fall to Jackson in your first battle. You didn't sign up to be surrendered. You signed up to fight. You signed up to be a victor. You signed up to save your country. All went wrong for you. Three weeks wearing a uniform. How do you feel? 1863, Maryland Heights, the high ground overlooking Harper's Ferry. The Yanks by this time had learned a lesson and they fortified the mountaintop. Massive fortifications. Gettysburg, the Union Army has moved north, they decide to abandon Harper's Ferry. And the Confederates are already in Pennsylvania. What happens? As they're abandoning the town and abandoning the forts and moving the ammunition in a terrible rainstorm, one of the powder magazines explodes, blows into the air, and kills dozens of men. A tragedy at Harper's Ferry. Names unknown in history unless you search hard for them. But they weren't unknown to their families. <laughs> these brothers, these fathers, sons, nephews, cousins, are dead. Not by a Confederate bullet, but by a Union cannon shell that accidentally blows up. They don't go home. 1864, you're living on High Street as a civilian. Here come the Confederates once again, another invasion. This one's led by Jubal Early, which ultimately leads us to our friends at Monocacy. But Jubal Early spends four days at Harper's Ferry trying to figure out what to do with the Harper's Ferry fortifications and the defenses there. While he's there, 
the Yankees blast early and the town. And if you were a civilian, and there weren't many of them, living in that town, like Annie Marmion, who was the same age as our vodcast students, living near the Catholic Church, in her stone building with her father, a doctor, and her family, you would have been terrified, absolutely terrified, as the big cannon were booming, and every time you heard one of those booms, you knew that there was a shell that would come shrieking toward you and toward the town. They hid in their basement, trembling, wondering not only would it end, but would their end come. We just recently commemorated the Joplin tornado yesterday. That was a tornado for the people of Harpers Ferry, but it came in the form of man-made explosives targeting them. And their home shook just like those Joplin buildings did. And many buildings would be destroyed, just like they were in Joplin. But it wasn't an act of God. It was American against American. Annie made it, and her family did. Others didn't. And finally, 1865. Appomattox, April the 9th. The war's over. There's jubilation and celebration in Harper's Ferry. The feeling of the end of a war. Some, we're feeling a bit of that presently. I think a lot of us would like to feel a lot more of that after we've been at war for almost a decade. But it ended. There's peace. And everyone knows that soon they'll be able to go home. Or if they've been away from home in Harper's Ferry, like Joseph Berry, he will be able to come home once again and return to the place that he loved. So it's impossible to describe the expression of feelings, although we attempt to do it in the book, on what it was like at the end of the war to have the bloodshed and the fear and the terror finally end and ultimately to be reunited once again, back together again as one America. At least the war has ended and we are a union once again. So this great jubilation and celebration suddenly just like these almost hanging balloons would be deflated, dramatically deflated with the assassination of Lincoln. The president who guided us through that turmoil and ultimately brought about our reunion and the soldiers at Harper's Ferry and the people at Harper's Ferry felt that assassination felt as if they truly had lost their own personal leader. And the jubilation became sadness. The celebration became quiet, except for one moment. The last time the guns would fire at Harper's Ferry from the Cannon on Maryland Heights would be in honor of Abraham Lincoln. And they would fire on the hour, every cannon in the forts. And they would fire at noon the cannon simultaneously in honor of Lincoln in a thunderous roar that God himself probably has never matched in the Harper's Ferry Water Gap. And finally, there was peace. I've had uh, good fortune, and like my friend Debbie Williams from Washington County, makes me emotional. I've had good fortune in uh, 55 years of uh, living in a place that's the journey through hallowed ground that has only recently been branded. But it's been a journey, a personal journey for all of us through this hallowed ground that we call home. And now we have a, a journey through hallowed ground that we share with the world and not just in our backyards. And we've even brought more meaning to the people that live in our backyards because they now appreciate what they have. And in many cases, that appreciation is through their kids who come home to them day in and day out and say, do you know what I did in school today? Which completely reverses the way it usually works, where mom and dad say, what did you do today? That's the, that's the power of the vodcast. 
That's the power of history. That's the power of connection with our past. And that's what these kids are doing, connecting themselves with those who came before them. And it is truly miraculous to see kids get excited and passionate like we are and know that they'll carry forward with that passion for the rest of their lives. The journey through hallowed ground is transformative. The vodcast is transformative. People change. Kids alter their lives and their careers because of what you do. I had the good fortune of working 35 years in researching Harper's Ferry. I'm even more fortunate that I've been able to live long enough to be able to share it through Harper's Ferry Under Fire. And again, the greatest honor for me is to be able to try to convey for you what they felt.